Good morning viewers. Welcome to our lesson today. We are going to learn science class 8. So my name is teacher Steplaton. I teach at the KBA group of schools in Kahawa West. Welcome. We'll be handling science class 8. We are going to talk about the topic animals. So in our topic animals, I'm going to start with a review. I'm going to start with a review of the previous classes because uh, you understand in science, when it comes to KCP, questions are set even from the previous classes. That is right from class one, class two, up to class eight. So I will start by revising what is taught in the previous classes before I go to what needs to be taught in the class eight work. So uh, the first thing you learn about animals is in grade one, and you talk about external parts of animals. So the external parts of an animal include the ears, the nose, the legs, the mouth, the horn, and the tail. Those are the external parts of an animal. We also have standard two work, and what you learn in standard two work are animals that are kept at home, and you also learn about wild animals. Animals that are kept at home are domestic animals, and uh, they include the cat, the dogs, and others. Then we also have wild animals. These are animals that are not kept at home, so they are found in the forests. And then we also have useful animals and harmful animals. Useful animals are just the animals we keep at home. That's why they are useful. For example, a dog. A dog is a useful animal. It helps in security. That's why it's kept at home. Then we have harmful animals. Harmful animals are mostly the pests. For example, we can have a mite, we can have a tick. Those are harmful animals. We also have mosquitoes. We also have snakes. Those are harmful animals. Now you should note that a dog is not a harmful animal but is a useful animal. And most examiners use it as a distractor. So it is good to know about it. Now, uh, we come to class three work. And class three work, you talk about behavior of animals. Now the behavior of animals, we look at movement of animals and protection of animals. Animals move from one place to another in different ways. These ways can be either walking, flying, crawling, hopping, or leaping. And we can also have galloping, for example, a horse. So those are ways through which animals move from one place to another. Many a times you'll get questions on the same in your exams. We also have ways through which animals protect themselves. Animals protect themselves from predators through the following ways. Animals can protect themselves by stinging, can protect themselves by running away, they can protect themselves by flying off, they can also protect themselves by hiding in shells. Now you should note something, we have flying and we have flying off. Flying is a way through which animals move from one place to another, that is different from flying off. Flying off is a way through which animals protect themselves. So get the difference between the two. Class four in animals, you learn about the characteristics of animals. All animals will feed, all animals will move, all animals will reproduce, they remove wastes, all animals grow, all animals reproduce, and they also react to changes in the environment. Not forgetting also all animals die. We also have animal products, animals and their products that they give. So we have a cattle or a cow will give us meat, will give us milk, 
also give us skin. Now, I want to emphasize only on sheep and goat because most examiners said there, a goat gives us more hair, mutton, and milk. But a cow gives us wool and mutton. So we don't get milk from sheep. So sheep gives us mutton and wool. But a goat gives us mutton, more hair, and uh, it, a goat gives us mutton, more hair, and milk. So you should get the difference that a goat gives us milk, but a cow does not give us milk. Standard 5 content, we talk about animals, and we look at classification of animals, where we look at the common thing in animals, that is a backbone. So animals that have a backbone are placed under one category called vertebrates, and animals without a backbone are also placed in another category called invertebrates. Vertebrates are five. We have mammals, we have reptiles, we have fish, we have birds, and we have amphibians. Those are uh, animals with, uh, with backbones and they're called vertebrates. The rest are invertebrates. Just a few examples, we have insects, we have spiders, we have snails, slugs, millipede and centipede, and others. Classics on animals, we talk about animal feeds. Animal feeds include pasture, we have fodder, and we also have concentrates and conserved feeds. Conserved feeds, we have hay and silage. Hay, which is stored under the sun, is stored and dried and stored under the sun. Silage is dried where we don't have sun. Then we also have Methods of grazing, that's a common question. Methods of grazing, we have three methods of grazing. The three methods of grazing are rotational grazing, zero grazing, also called stall feeding, and herding. Then we have examples of rotational grazing, which include uh, tethering, we have paddocking, and we have strip grazing. Then constituents of a balanced diet, also classics. Constituents of a balanced diet include proteins, vitamins, fats and oils. Also water is a constituent of a balanced diet. Class seven, on the same topic, you learn about parasites and livestock parasites. Livestock parasites, we can talk about internal parasites found inside the body and external parasites that are found outside the body. Example, an example of an internal parasite can be a tapeworm, it's found inside the body. An example of an external parasite can be a tick. A tick is found outside the body. Then we have control measures. I'm only mentioning the major points in the previous classes. We'll focus so much in class eight. So we have uh, control measures. So the best control measure for internal parasites, that is deworming, and the best control measure for external parasites that is dipping, and the best overall for both internal and external parasites, that is rotational grazing or controlled grazing. So that is what you learned in the previous classes. So having looked at what we learned on the topic animals, we are going to look at what we need to learn in class eight. Yes. We are going to look at adaptations of animals. That is our class eight content that we need to, to, to look at. Now, before we talk about adaptation of animals, we need to, to understand this word we call adaptation. What is the meaning of adaptation? So let's look at the meaning of adaptation. So an adaptation, we can call it, these are adjustments that happen in an animal. Adaptations are adjustments that enable an animal to survive in a particular environment. So adaptations, these are adjustments that enable 
an animal to survive in a particular So adaptations, these are adjustments that enable an animal to survive in a particular environment. That is what we call adaptations. And based on feeding, animals can be adapted in three different ways. So these three ways are dependent on what the animal eats. So when we look at feeding, we can categorize animals as either omnivorous animals carnivorous animals or herbivorous animals. Now let's define what are herbivorous, what are carnivorous, what are omnivorous. Starting with omnivorous animals, we can say that omnivorous animals are animals that feed on both flesh and vegetables. So they feed on both flesh and vegetables and an example of an omnivorous animal is a pig. So omnivorous animals feed on both flesh and vegetables, and an example is a pig. Cup of water. So we have herbivorous animals, and these are animals that feed on vegetable materials or herbs. The other name of herbs are green plants. So animals that feed on vegetable materials or green plants, we call them herbivorous animals. And an example of a herbivorous animal we can give is a sheep. So a sheep feeds entirely on vegetable matter and we call it a herbivorous animal. Then we also have carnivorous animals. Carnivorous animals feed mainly on flesh. And an example of carnivorous animals we can have a lion. So those are the three categories of animals based on what they feed. So we are going to look at the adaptations of these animals, the carnivorous animals, the omnivorous animals, and the herbivorous animals. So let's start with the adaptations of omnivorous animals. So adaptations of omnivorous animals. Omnivorous animals can also be called omnivores. We will not focus so much here because the content mainly focuses on carnivores and herbivores. So adaptations here we will only look at two. So they have four types of teeth. They have four types of teeth and the four types of teeth are uh, we have incisors, we have canines, we have premolars, and we have molars. Incisors are used for cutting and biting, canines are used for tearing flesh, premolars and molars are used for chewing, grinding, and crushing. The other type of adaptation is they have two sets of teeth. They have two sets of teeth. That's another ad adaptation for omnivorous animals. The teeth, the two sets of teeth are primary or also called milk teeth, and then we have permanent teeth. These are the, the adaptations of omnivores that we'll talk about. And then we come to adaptations of herbivorous animals. So this point here will focus so much because examiners set so many questions on adaptations of herbivorous animals. So let's look at adaptations of herbivores. Adaptations of herbivorous animals. And as we said, herbivorous animals are animals that feed on vegetable matter only. The vegetable matter here we're talking about plants. So let's look at some adaptations of the herbivorous animals. So they have chisel shaped incisors. Okay. Now, because you are able to see uh, what I'm talking about, so I'll not write so much. So they have chisel shaped incisors. 
that are used for biting, holding, and nibbling food. The chisel shaped in herbivorous animals, their main function is to bite, hold, and nibble food. They have what you call a honey pad, and the honey pad is found on the upper jaw. And the purpose of the honey pad in herbivorous animals is used for holding food material so that they can be cut by the incisors that are on the lower jaw. So the honey pad is found on the upper jaw of the mouth while the incisors are found on the lower jaw. So the main purpose of the honey pad is to hold the food matter as it is being cut by the incisors. So the other, the other adaptation is they have a diastema. A diastema is a toothless gap that is found before the premolars. So this is a region on the lower jaw that has no teeth. And the purpose of a diastema is used to turn the food. When the animal is chewing, the food has to be turned so that it can be properly chewed. And what enables that turning of food is what you call a diastema. Then they have premolars and molars that have ridges. Cusps and ridges. We know characteristics of premolars and molars, they have cusps and ridges. These are the cusps that I'm talking about in the premolars and in the molars. So if that is your premolar, this, this is what I'm referring to, cusps and ridges. So they have cusps and ridges that fit into each other very well, and that fitting enables proper chewing of food. The next is that they have jaws that slide in a circular manner. The jaws of a herbivorous animal slide in a circular manner. This circular manner enables the food matter to be chewed properly because they keep on chewing. Then the premolars and molars of the herbivorous animal, they wear out or they wear off. From your concept of friction, we know that friction leads to wear and tear as one of the disadvantages of friction. Now, because this herbivorous animal keeps on chewing every now and then, that chewing causes friction. And that friction results to wear and tear of the premolars and the molars. Now, for that reason, the premolars and molars, they grow. They keep on growing and growing and replacing each other so that the animal can continue chewing properly. Then the last adaptation on herbivorous animals, they have a very long and rough tank. They have a very long and rough tank. Now, the tank is long to enable it to hold the food. If you have ever watched a cow feeding, you see the tank getting out in a circular motion and grabbing the food. That is why it is long. And it is rough so that it can prevent injuries. Animals that are herbivorous eat matter that can be dangerous or can be hurting. For example, napier grass. Now, the tank is rough so that the tank cannot get hurt while it's eating some of the vegetable materials like napier grass. Next slide, please. Then this one is a, a diagram to show herbivorous animal, the mouth of herbivorous animal. This one is the mouth of a sheep. So we have the honey pad. You can look at the honey pad is on the upper jaw. We have incisors on the lower jaw. Then we have the canines, premolars and molars. We have the diastema just before the premolars. That's where the food turns. So those are the adaptations of a herbivorous animal and an example was a sheep. So we can move to the next, uh, which are carnivorous animal. Let's look at adaptations of carnivorous animals. Carnivorous animals are animals that feed on flesh. So they feed on flesh entirely. So their adaptation has to be in a way that when they feed on flesh, they can be able to survive, unlike the herbivorous or omnivorous animals. So the adaptations of the teeth should be able to tear food, should be able to crush bones, and should be able to chew meat properly. So let's look at some of these adaptations of carnivorous animal. Number one, we talk about sharp and pointed incisors used for catching and holding prey. They have sharp and pointed incisors. Unlike herbivores, which we look, they have incisors that are chisel-shaped. 
in carnivorous animals, the incisors are sharp and pointed. They are sharp and pointed with the reason of catching and holding the prey. When you watch wild animals, the documentaries on wild animals, for example, when a cheetah is running after a gazelle, after it has grabbed the gazelle, you will see it using the incisors to catch the prey and to hold the prey firmly. So that is one of the adaptations. And another adaptation is they have long and pointed canines. They have long and pointed canines. The canines are in the shape of a dagger and they are used to hold prey tightly and eventually kill it. When the incisors of a carnivorous animal are directed to the neck of its prey, the, in, the canines are able to hold and eventually kill that prey that the, the carnivorous animal wants to feed on. They have also what you call carnassial teeth, and carnassial teeth are the first molars on the upper jaw and the last premolars on the lower jaw. And the purpose of carnassial teeth, carnassial teeth are used for slicing flesh and cracking bones. They are used to slice flesh and crack bone. That's a very common question in KCPE. And you should note that carnassial teeth are adapted premolars and molars. Carnassial teeth are adapted premolars and molars and their function is to crush bones and to slice the flesh because they feed on flesh entirely. Now, the molars, just like in the herbivorous, also have ridges, the cusps and ridges that I was drawing there, that fit into each other very well. And the purpose for that is to enable it to chew the food properly. Meat is hard, is hard substance, so the animal has to chew it properly. That's why the cusps and the ridges fit into each other very well. Then the teeth of the carnivorous animals, the teeth of the carnivorous animals are well spaced. From one teeth, from one tooth to the other. You can look at that diagram. The teeth are well spaced and the purpose for them being spaced is to avoid food particles sticking in between the teeth. So the purpose for that is to avoid food particles to stick in between each other. They have what you call a streamlined body. And a streamlined body is a type of a body that is sharp at the front. Let me draw a streamlined body. It's sharp at the front and that towards the end it expands. So an example of a streamlined body looks something like that. So this is what you could refer to as a streamlined body. Just in case you're wondering what a streamlined body is. So carnivorous animals have a streamlined body, which means they are sharp towards the front. And the purpose for this streamlined body is to help in movement. It's to help in fast movement. Most of carnivorous animals, they run very fast. Take, for example, a cheetah. What, one of the reasons why a cheetah runs very fast is because it has a streamlined body. That is an adaptation of a carnivorous animal. And then some of them camouflage. To camouflage means the body and the surrounding merge. Take, for example, a lion. A lion is found mostly where we have tall grasses. The body of a lion is brown, and the grasses where the lion is, or where the lions stay, they're also brown in color. So this one enables it to camouflage such that when the lion is attacking its prey, the prey will be caught by surprise. It will not see the lion coming. And that is an adaptation such that they can be able to kill. Because if they don't kill, they don't get food. And if they don't get food, they will eventually die out of starvation. So that camouflaging helps the carnivorous animal to catch its prey out of surprise without it noticing. Then they also have a very strong sense of sight and smell. They can be able to see a very far distance and notice a prey and be able to attack. 
or they can also feel the smell of its prey and they can be able to attack. Those are the characteristics or the adaptations of carnivorous animals that enable it to survive and feed on flesh. So you can take a look at the diagram of the carnivorous animal. We have the incisors. You can see the incisors that are sharp and pointed, just as we said. You can also look at the canines. The canines look like a dagger for slicing and eventually killing. You can look at the premolars and molars, and you can look at the carnassial teeth. They're there. They are adapted premolars and molars. They are on both jaws. And we said, or I said the purpose of that is to crack the bones and tear the flesh. So that is the adaptations based on feeding. And according to animals, we can have the herbivorous, the carnivorous, and the omnivorous. So, next slide. Uh, we can look at now birds. Birds are also adapted differently according to their feeding adaptations. Now, based on birds, we can have birds that feed on grains, and they are called green eaters. We can have birds that feed on flesh, and we can call them flesh eaters. So let's start with the green eaters. Green eaters, and an example of a green eater you can look is a dove. And doves have a short, straight, strong, and thick beak, and their feet are adapted to patching. We look at filter feeders. Filter feeders have a flat, serrated beak, and an example is a duck. They also have webbed feet because they get their food on muddy places. So their beak are serrated. The, the meaning of serrated, just to demonstrate on the board, to be serrated means to have a zigzag-like shape. So the purpose of this zigzag-like shape is to filter is to filter the food because they, they get their food on the mud. So an example of that bird is a duck. We also have flesh eaters. And an example of a flesh eater is an eagle. Eagles or flesh eaters, they have strong claws called talons. And these strong claws are able to hold the prey and also help in tearing. They also have a strong curved beak that is adapted to cutting and tearing flesh. They, we have an example of a diagram of an eagle. You can look at the beak and you can look at the talons. Then we also have nectar feeders, which have a long and slender beak. They have a long and slender beak. They are also light in weight. They are light in weight because most of them, they will either balance on air or they will patch on flowers. And you know flowers are not so strong to support a heavy weight. So they are light for that reason because one, they can balance on air, and two, they can be able to patch on flowers such that the flower can be able to support its weight. And an example of a nectar feeder, we can have a sunbird. Sunbird is the best example of a, field of a nectar eater. And uh, we can also have a hummingbird as another example. That is adaptation of birds based on feeding. We can look at movement adaptation. Because we're talking about adaptations, let's look at movement adaptations. There are reasons why animals move from one place to another. And animals move from one place to another to search for food, to search for meat, to escape from enemies, to search for shelter, to look for favorable conditions, and also to migrate. And they can move either by flying, swimming, hopping, or leaping. Now, these movements, they have their own adaptations, like flying. The adaptations to flying are as follows. Presence of wings, which can be used for flying. Streamlined body for easy movement, as we said in carnivorous animals. 
Then they have a flat tail. The flat tail can be used as brakes when the bird wants to stop while it's flying. They have hollow bones. Hollow bones are bones without a bone marrow so that they can make them light such that flight can be easy. Then they don't have earlobes and the purpose for not having earlobes is to reduce the movement. Then bats, which also fly, have fur instead of feathers. Adaptations to swimming, animals that swim, they have a streamlined body. They have fins, which they use for swimming. They also have gills, which is they are used for breathing. Then they have scales that point backwards. And the purpose for the scales pointing backwards is to reduce the friction between the animal that is flying and the air. The purpose for the for the for the scales for the scales pointing backwards is to reduce friction between the fish, if it's a fish, and the water. Then they also produce a mucus substance. The mucus substance enables lubrication so that the fish can easily move. Then they have a swim bladder, also called an air bladder, that enables the fish, if it's a fish, to remain afloat on water. Then the last point on adaptations of swimming, they also have webbed feet if it is a swimming bird. It can have webbed feet. Also frogs swim, they also have webbed feet. We can look at adaptation to hopping, adaptations to hopping. Adaptations to hopping one, the animal has a streamlined body also for movement. They have strong, powerful hind legs. And these strong, powerful hind legs enable the animal to pop, to power up before hopping. And then the front legs are short, such that they can act as shock absorbers during landing. And then kangaroos have their tails, that they use their tails to balance. Those are examples of adaptations of swimming, hopping, and flying. So these are all adaptations of the animals. So we have looked at feeding. We have also looked at movement and how these animals are adapted differently. There are also other forms of movement that we have not looked at, but we can just mention some of them. Slithering is a form of movement. And an example of an animal that slithers is a snake. Uh, we have gliding as another form of movement. Gliding as another form of movement. And an example of an, an animal that glides is a snail or a slug. We also have wriggling, that is in caterpillars. So the movement of a caterpillar is wriggling. Then we have galloping. And an example of an animal that gallops is a horse. So those are some of the other movements that animals move in from place to place. So having looked at the adaptations of the animals according to feeding and according to movement, we can now look at something else on ill health under the topic animals in class 8, ill health in animals. Animals can be ill due to various reasons. Animals like human beings also get sick. So just like a human being, when you are sick, you need treatment, an animal the same. It can fall sick either after eating wrong food that can cause discomfort or just being, at, being attacked by illness. So how can you know that a certain animal is ill? These are signs of ill health in animals. So we look at these in domestic animals. If you are keeping a domestic animal, there are indicators that can show you your domestic animal is ill. And an example of a sign of ill health is stunted growth. Stunted growth simply means an animal that is not growing. It grows and reaches a certain level and stops. That's what is referred to as stunted growth. 
blood in stool is another example. So an animal that has blood in stool, that is an indicator that the animal is sick. We have coughing, animals cough. It might look funny, but it's the truth. Animals cough. Animals that are ill also have a rough coat. They lose weight also, reduction of weight. An animal needs to be healthy and fat, especially those animals that give us meat. So when the animal loses weight, that is an indication that the animal is ill. Then we also have reduced yields. Reduced yields comes with quantity. Take for example a cow which used to give five liters of milk, maybe a day, and then the liters start to reduce from five to four to three to one. That is what we refer to as reduced yields. So from five liters to two liters, that is a reduction in the yield. And when such happens, that is an indicator that the animal is sick. So we can look at the last subtopic on this topic. Then we can also look at some sample of KCP question before our time elapses. So let's look at effects of livestock diseases. Now, when an animal becomes sick, what are the effects? One of the effects is low yields. Remember, on the sign, we talked about reduced yields. Reduced yield is the process through which the yield start to reduce from five liters of milk, the example I gave, to four liters, to three liters, then to two liters. That is what we call reduced yields, and that is a sign. Now, I want you to get the difference between reduced yields and low yields. Low yield now is as the result of reduced yield, what we get at the end. Now, when we start getting the two liters of milk continuously, now that is low yield. I hope you have gotten the difference between reduced yield and low yields. And reduced yield is a sign, while low yield is an effect. Then we have reduced quality of products. So quality comes with how good something is. So reduced quality. So the, the product that you get starts to depreciate in terms of quality. That is what we mean by reduced yield. And then transmission of diseases. Animals that are sick can transmit diseases to consumers. If you take meat from an animal that was sick and you consume it, you are also likely to be sick. So it can transmit diseases from the animal to the consumer. That is an effect. And the last one is death of the animal. And also it can lead to death of the person who has consumed that meat of the animal that was sick. So the effects are four. We have low yields, reduced quality, transmission of diseases, and also death of animals and also death of humans. So that is on the topic adaptations of animals in class eight. Now this topic animals is examinable in KCP up to seven questions. It can come to up to seven questions in KCP. So it is good. You need to know that it is an examinable topic. And the questions range from all the classes that I started from class one or grade one nowadays up to class eight. So let's look at some of the few questions that were tested in the previous year. So we start with the former year, the immediate former year, which was 2019. Then we look at uh, 2018, just a few. Then the other years also. So let's look at some of these questions that were tested. So we have KCP sample questions, 2019, number 44. I will read, which one of the following is an adaptation to both flying and swimming? Which one of the following is an adaptation to both flying and swimming? So we have looked at it here, and the best adaptation to both flying and swimming is streamlined body. Strong hind legs, this one is an adaptation to hopping only. Presence of wings, that is an adaptation to flying only. Webbed feet, that is an adaptation to swimming only. But streamlined body is both an adaptation to flying, swimming, and also it's an adaptation to carnivorous animals. They have a streamlined body, 
that helps it to move very fast. So that was a question last year. Let's look at another question also last year. Number 45. The following are adaptations to feeding in herbivores. The following are adaptations to feeding in herbivores. Which, which ones are used for turning food in the mouth? Which information is used for turning food in the mouth? So we look at the answers, presence of a honey pad and continuously growing teeth, rough tank and presence of diastema, presence of a honey pad and rough tank, continuously growing teeth and presence of a diastema. The right answer is boy, a rough tank and presence of diastema. The rough tank I said, number one is long and rough, long to hold the food, rough to prevent from injuries and their diastema enables the food to turn continuously. So our right answer was rough tank and presence of diastema. So you can notice that in 2019, two questions on adaptations of animals were set. And the two questions came from the same topic, that is class eight. One was on movement, that is swimming and flying, and the other one was on adaptation in herbivorous animals. We can look at the next question. How many minutes? Are so we have uh, another question. Let me look at three more questions, then we can end there. 2012, number 15, 2012, number 15. Which of the following are examples of herbivorous, carnivorous, and omnivorous, respectively? So a herbivorous animal, carnivorous animal, and omnivorous animal. So we can have a hippopotamus, a crocodile, and a chimpanzee as our answer. A hippopotamus is a herbivorous animal, a crocodile is a carnivorous animal, and a chimpanzee is an omnivorous animal. The rest are wrong, so let me be a little bit faster. Birds that have short, straight, and thick beak. Birds that have short, straight, and thick beak. That was 2011, number 34. Those are birds that act, or they are grain eaters. These are birds that eat on grains. The last question, which one of the following pairs consists only of omnivorous animals? Omnivorous animals are animals that feed on both flesh and vegetables. And the omnivorous animals in this case is a chimpanzee and a pig. Choice boy, hyena is out because it's carnivorous. Choice C, both are out because a hippo is a herbivorous and a crocodile is a carnivorous. And choice D is also out because a hippo is a herbivorous animal. So the right answer was chimpanzee and pig. So we have other quiz KCP questions that you can look at. You can note them down. There, there are other KCP questions. We have 2009, number 42, 2007, number 22, 2004, number 25, 2006, number 16, 2014, number 10, 2008, number 38, 2005, number 23, 2007, number 22, 2016, number 21, and 2018, number 18. So that is the end of our lesson. Uh, let me see if I have any question that have been asked. I have very few minutes. Any question that is asked? Uh, which topic can we mostly concentrate in science? Let me answer some few questions. Which topics can we mostly concentrate in science? One of the main topics you need to concentrate in science, that is properties of matter. It carries up to 12 questions in KCP. You can also look, you can also concentrate on making work easier. There are so many questions that come, up to nine questions. And also animals and plants. Those are the questions that you can measure on. Someone is asking, the strong and hooked claws of an eagle are called, I say they are called talons. I'm answering the question asked. The strong and hooked claws 
of an eagle are called talons. You could be able to see the example of an eagle that I had drawn. Uh, we can look at the next. Someone is asking me to repeat about carnassial teeth. Carnassial teeth are modified premolars and molars. Carnassial teeth are modified premolars and molars. And their main purpose is to crush bones and also tear the flesh. And also slice, not tear, slice the flesh. So carnassial teeth are used to crush bones and slice the flesh. Maybe the last question. Maybe the last question. So I'm, I'm looking at the other questions. Okay, someone is asking me to please repeat low yields and reduced yields. So let me explain it better, low yields and reduced yields. You can keep your questions coming. I'll be answering them as fast as I can. Low yields. and reduced yields. So I said reduced yields is a sign of ill health in animals and low yields is an effect. And low yields comes with a quantity. Quantity means number. And I give an example of a cow that produces milk, five liters of milk. So we have a cow that gives five liters of milk. I want to differentiate re reduced yields and low yields. Now, reduced yields will appear as a sign in which way? You know that your cow gives you five liters of milk. So you milk it, and then you get four liters of milk in one day. You give it food normally. You give it a balanced diet. And the four liters of milk, instead of increasing to five, they reduce to three liters of milk. You continue feeding your animal correctly, and the liters reduce up to two liters of milk. Then when they reach at two liters, it becomes an optimum. Now your cow starts giving you two liters of milk, the cow which was giving you five liters of milk. While it is reducing from four, three, two, that's now what we are referring to as reduced yields. It is reducing from four to three, to two, and that is a sign when the, it is, when the product is reducing. Now, when we reach an optimum of two liters, such that your cow starts to give two liters of milk, it is now not reducing, it is at optimum. Now that is not reduced yields, but now that is low yields. So when it reduces and reaches a particular figure, that is now low yields, and that is an effect, not a sign. I hope you have been able to get the difference. Okay, let me look at the last question. Uh, Brian, I'm Brian. My question is, does carnivores teeth, can they break while breaking the bones? The answer is no, they cannot break because they have been adapted. And I started by saying, adaptation mean adjustments. These are adjustments that happen to enable an animal to survive. Now, the teeth of a carnivorous animals have been adjusted. They are not like ours. They have been adjusted such that when they are crushing the bones, they cannot break. It is not like for us. If you crush a bone, Brian there, I'm sure if you crush a bone, you might not have your teeth. So that is not likewise to carnivorous animals. So their teeth are in a way that the carnassial teeth, they can break the bones without them breaking. So they do not break. They do not break. Difference between a diastema and a honey pad. I will kindly ask my director to show me the diagram on herbivorous animals on slide five, kindly. Difference between diastema and honey pad, slide five. So, one is asking what's the difference between a honey pad and a diastema. I want you to look at that diagram as I explained to you. A honey pad is found on the upper jaw. You can look at it, it's on the upper jaw. 
while a diastema is found on the lower jaw. That is the first difference. The second difference is a horny pad is used for holding the food. It's used to hold the food such that the incisors which are on the lower jaw can be able to cut the food. So a horny pad is like a surface where the food is placed before it is chopped by the incisors. If I can put it that way for you to understand better. So a honey pad is like a surface where the food are placed, then the food is cut by the incisors. While a diastema is a toothless gap. Toothless means no teeth. So there is no teeth there. That's why it's called a toothless gap. And the purpose of the diastema, it enables the animal to turn the food as it is chewing the food. That's the difference between a horny pad and a diastema. I hope you have gotten the right answer. So there being no more questions, I would like us to end there. Uh, may you have a good day and continue revising for KCP. Science is a very simple subject and I wish you all the best of luck. For all those who are tuned in, have yourselves a nice day.